Actually, the presentation is less important because it's in YouTube. Uh, and uh, actually, you're all wasting time. You can go and watch it over YouTube. So uh, the fact I'm here, uh, while I do my talk, feel free to raise your hand and ask questions. The discussion is more important to me than uh, the things I'm about to say. Uh, my name is David Schwartz. I work for Wix for the last seven years. Uh, I'm the VP product, and I also had three products in Wix, the e-commerce, uh, Wix Promote, which are marketing tools for our users. And, uh, okay. And uh, Wix Bookings. A little bit about what Wix does. Uh, Wix is a technology that allows everyone to build websites. Just like, okay. Just like you can build a presentation with PowerPoint or write a Word document with Word, uh, you can build a website with Wix. What I wanted to talk to you about today was challenges in going globally. I have three issues I want to cover. Maybe I will not get to all three of them. The first one, which I think is the most important one, is how you, if you sit in Ukraine, or us as Wix when we sit in Israel, can know our users uh, when they are not in the country where we live at. We are living and working in Ukraine, we are living and working in, in, uh, in uh, Israel, but the users But the users are far away. They are not with us. Now, uh, why is it important to know your users? Guess what? If you are doing a product and you will not know your users, your competition will know them. And if the competition will know the users, they will base their product and strategy on knowledge. And you will be guessing. If you are very smart people, this may work for you for the short term. But for the long term, it will not work. You need to know, you know, when, when you go to business school, they tell you, you know, know the gender, uh, know the, uh, the age of your users. But there are other facts about your users that if you will not know, you will obviously fail. As an example, if you're in Wix, we serve small businesses. What, what are those businesses? What, what do they do? How do they earn money? Or if you make a product, how knowledgeable are your users about computer? Are they like your grandmother? Are there office users? Are there software engineers? If you do not know these facts, there is no chance you're going to succeed. So a little bit about Wix. 50% of our users are in the US. The rest are in 190 countries around the world. Israel is totally not strategic market for us. Just as probably Ukraine will not be a strategic market for any company here who would like to start a product company. So how do you get to know them? So there are several ways that they teach us to, uh, to know users. And the first one is usability testing. The book tells you that you will grab a bunch of users and you will put them in a room and you will look at them interacting with your product and then supposedly uh, you will know how the users are working. So in theory, all you have to do is take a plane, visit New York, grab a bunch of users and do usability testing. But our experience is that it does not work. And why it does not work? It does not work because people like, when, when, people, come, when, when people interact with your product in reality, there is a very short distance between the user and the X on the side. If your product is not good, the user will click the X and you lost the user for good. But when the user come to usability test, they want to be nice to you and they want to pretend they are very smart. So they will give you much, much more credit than they will in the real product. So if you do usability testing, most chances are that uh, you will be misleaded. You can, may actually think your product works, but it does not. So how do you confront that? It's not that I have a crystal clear solution for that. I can tell you what we did. Uh, and by the way, like everything I said today, it's not necessarily will work for you, but you can use it as a sort of inspiration. And what we did, we opened an office in New York, a small office, 
And, we based, and, and as you know, the real estate in New York is very expensive, rent is high. And we invited small businesses to come and work in this office for free. Not necessarily Wix users, but guess what? Every small business needs to build a website. So these people, these small businesses, when they come to work in our New York office, most of them are building websites. And then all you have to do is go there, look at them as they work, and see how they interact in real time with your product. And this is more realistic sanity check of your product than your average usability testing. Again, not necessarily a solution that will work for you, but something to learn from. Another very important and critical issue is support. Guess what? Most of your users will not contact your support. They will just leave you. If your product doesn't work well, they will leave. But some of them are giving you a gift and they are contacting your support. They are calling or they're writing email or whatever means of support uh, you guys are using. And it will be extremely, extremely unwise not to learn from these support calls. What we basically do in Wix, we have this analytic system that allows uh, us to count all the support calls. We document them. And we basically know what are the issues our users are talking to us and asking more. We know what the feature requests are. We know what the problems are. Moreover, we actually built a system that allows every product manager and every manager in the company to go and answer support calls by themselves. And this is extremely valuable. Somebody gives you a gift. They call you and they say, this and this does not work for me. Talk to them. Don't give... Don't give this information to go to the agents and die there. Because this is probably your most valuable information on getting to know your users that are far away. Thirdly, talk to users. Now, everybody know, as I said before, that you should talk to users, know their business, who they are, etc. But what I want to invite you to do is talk to users that are not your users. And when I say users that are not your users, I talk about three very important groups. One of them is users that failed in what we call the funnel. I'll give you an example about funnel uh, from Wix. A person goes to Wix.com, let's say this lady, so she may log in or she may not. Let's say she logged in, then you, you logged in, maybe you'll open the Wix editor, maybe not. And then, let's say we're talking about uh, the e-commerce product of Wix. So maybe you'll save your store, maybe not. Maybe you'll add product, maybe not. Maybe you'll connect payment gateway, maybe not. And then eventually, sir, maybe you will do a premium or not, which is eventually the goal to get paid. Now, guess what? She fell in the login, you fell in the open editor, you fell in the save, and so on and so forth. But why? Why did she fail login? Why did he not open the editor? Why didn't you save the product? Why didn't you connect the payment gateway? Why eventually didn't you pay? You will not know this and the analytics will not tell you. The only way to know this is to call these users and ask them or email these users and ask them. Now it's not a perfect system because let's say thousands of people failed in the login and you are willing to talk to me. The fact that you are willing to talk to me makes you a little different than the others. But yet, if I talk to 20 people and 10 people give me the same answer, I did not connect a payment gateway because the form was too complex. So I gave up. I know something about my product that I didn't know before. I can go and I can fix it. And this is probably the most powerful way to fix your product, talking to users who dropped in the funnel. Another very important not, you, not your users group is users from relevant business. Let's say you are building a product for small businesses. That's what Wix does. So most of the small businesses in the world are not my customers yet. But I need to constantly talk to them. Talk to ones who are not my users and understand what their business is, what their life is, what are they looking for. And design my products accordingly. And last but not least, users of the competition. While many people who start uh, global companies talk to their users, 
and look at the competition's product, and looking at the competition's product is super important, they don't bother talking to the competitor's users. And that's, I think, a very interesting thing to do. As an example, uh, I lead a product in Wix called Wix Stores. I have a strong competitor called Shopify, also store builder. I'm talking to Shopify users all the time. I ask them, what's good about Shopify's product? What's bad about Shopify product? Why did you choose Shopify and not Wix? And I don't do this to get them to move from Shopify to Wix. It's $20 users in our case a month. It doesn't worth my time talking to them to move them. It's small customers. I talk to them to understand, to know, to intimately know my customers and my market. And by the way, uh, I talk to Wix users, and we have 100 million users, and I'm in the management of a, of a NASDAQ company. I talk to three or four users every day. That's the only way I can improve the product. I don't know another way to do that. And above all, uh, analytics, data. Uh, business intelligence, BI, knowing where your users are clicking, where they're not clicking, what they're doing, what they're not doing. Uh, deciding which gods do you worship. I'm not a religious person, but I have three gods. One of them is conversion. I worship conversion from free to premium. That's how I get paid. Second, I worship churn. Users who paid me and leave, minimizing them. That's another god I worship. And the third god I worship is number of support calls per user. This checks the quality of my product. If I get more support calls per user, it means my product is becoming more complex. If I'm getting less support calls per user, I watch these KPIs. That's the first thing I do when I open my eyes in the morning. I get a report that I watch this. Another very effective way to use data is A-B testing. You're launching a new feature. Divide your users to two groups, group A and group B. Give the new feature to group A, don't give the new feature to group B and see which group performs better with the gods you're worshiping. Conversion, churn, whatever is relevant to your business. Maybe the feature you did did not make an impact. And guess what? If the feature did not make an impact, it's a bad feature because it made your product more complex. You need to support it. You need to continue working on it. So take it out. And last but not least, MVPs. People are mistaken about what MVP is. MVP is not a product you're taking out there. The product you're taking out there is called first phase. MVP is an experiment. And I'll give you an example. Let's say I want to offer a new feature for my users. An easy way to do Facebook advertisements. OK. I can send my engineers to develop these features. And uh, I can write code. And I can waste tons of time and energy, and I can fail. But I can do another thing. I can put an MVP, a dummy button, in my product saying, add Facebook ads. And then I can see how many users are clicking it. By the way, if they click it, I'll put a screen coming soon. And it's totally OK. And I will check the data. Maybe the users are not interested in this feature. And if they're not interested in this feature and I did not develop it, I saved time, I saved energy, and my product is less complex in the end. So uh, these are basically the way in Wix that we confront this huge challenge of knowing our users that are not where we are. Again, uh, I'm not saying it will fit you. You need to think what's the best ways for you to know your users because your product is different than mine. But I can guarantee to you one thing for sure. If you will not know your users intimately, intimately, like you know your lover, you will fail. Today in our world, if you don't know your users, you fail for sure. So it's worth your effort. Another challenge I want to talk about is uh, delivery-oriented product management. It's not, a, and it's not a thing that's connected directly to global companies, but if you want to start a product company, this is a challenge you will have to confront. Again, I'm not saying the ways we do it in Wix, confronting it will work for you, but I tell them to know how we confront that and you can learn from yourselves. So 
Uh, I've been to the software industry for longer than I remember, but I have friends who do other types of engineering, like civil engineering. Imagine that an average city would look like that, where 90% of the buildings are not finished. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the software industry. 90% of the software products are never finished. They're just never finished. And almost 100% of the products are never finished on time. And I'm not bullshitting you here. This is something everybody that's in this industry knows very well. I see the smiles on your faces, but you shouldn't laugh, ladies and gentlemen. You should actually cry. You know, uh, a manager goes to the product manager, the product manager, when the project will be finished. The product manager goes to the software engineer. The software engineer tells him January, but the product manager is very careful. So he goes to the manager and say, merch. The manager was a very careful person, goes to the management and tells them, we will launch in June. And guess what? The product is actually launched in January of the year afterwards. And this is if it was launched at all. So I would like to suggest something I tried to do in Wix, which I call the no man approach to product to confront this problem. What is the no man approach? Are you familiar with the term yes man? You know what yes man does? He say yes, 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 yes. And what a no man does? They say no. I think it's a very nice thing to say no. Let's try to modify a little bit the questions we're asking. Instead of asking, why do we need this project? Let's ask, do we need this project at all? Is this project needed? Maybe it's not a needed project. And then we can save time and do important things. Let's stop bragging about our products. We have this and this and this and this. You know, you ask, what's the advantage of your startup? I have this feature. The competition doesn't have it. I have this feature and this feature and this feature. Let's brag about something else. Let's try to say we are simpler. We are cleaner. I want to share an experience with you, something we call an epiphany. I am an old person. Yesterday, I was 44 years old. So I started using the internet when the internet was very young, before Google. And we had all those weird search engines, Lycos and, and Alta Vista. Maybe the old people in the audience are familiar with them. Let me tell you why they died. I remember the day Google was launched. I remember going to google.com. I opened Google and you know what I saw? Before that, in Alta Vista and Lycos, there was this screen full of texts and pictures. Everybody wanted to be a portal, but everybody just wanted to search. But the search box was small and surrounded by all this noise. And then Google came, and you know what we had? We had a white screen, a search box, search. There was another button, I'm feeling lucky, because even Google cannot resist the urge of doing something that is not needed. And the feeling was a feeling of air. I could breathe. Now they will bullshit you and they will tell you that Google won because of the smart algorithm of Sergey Brin. Bullshit. Google won because of this feeling. Because everybody went there. At the beginning, the results of Alta Vista were better than the results of Google. I know that. Because I, I, I was a user. But the experience was so great because it was simpler and cleaner. They had less features. So maybe we should start thinking that way. Maybe instead of asking what extra features do you need, ask what features can you take out? Use those smart techniques we talked about, not to add things that your users need. Take out the things that your users do not need. Uh, another thing that a no man does, a no man knows they're stupid. You may be very smart. I guess most of the people here are extremely intelligent. Ukrainians are very, very known for the intelligence of the product managers and the engineers. I'm not joking. That's, that's the image Ukraine has. Really, I'm serious. But the smartest you are, you still cannot guess what your users need. Base your knowledge about information, not about guessing. The core that I'm trying to invite you to do 
is do a phase one, not an MVP. An MVP is an experiment. Phase one, good product, but a product that is lean and mean and good, but small in scope. Think about this as axis. You know, you get a project, so there is the axis of the quality. You will hear from your engineers and from your product, you know, we don't have time, we don't have resources. Let's fuck up, sorry about my French, about the quality. Let's make a dirty code. Let's make dirty product. Don't compromise on quality. So then they tell you, maybe we will increase the budget. Maybe more money will allow us to finish on time. Or worse than that, maybe we will hire more people. More engineers and more product managers. You know, by the way, what happens when you hire more people for a project? It slows you down in the beginning because you need to teach them what to do. So don't compromise on quality. Don't add budget and don't add HR and definitely don't do what we are all doing. Add time. No, not June, September, October, November, December. No. So if you don't change the quality and you don't change the budget and you don't add HR, and you don't change the time. What can you play with? Ladies and gentlemen, you can play with the scope. You can develop less. And that is what no man does. Now again, I'm not saying this will work for everybody, but that is actually the way we do product management at Wix. Uh, I want to give you an example, a live example. But by the way, what you see here is a wireframe, uh, the most effective tool of a product manager. And this is the wireframes of a product I did a few years ago in Wix called the Wix App Market. Basically allow third party engineers to put their products into Wix and sell them. Now you already know me for the last 20, 25 minutes I've been talking to you and you know I'm a data driven person. I don't like guessing, I like data. So you may see that when I designed it, one of the first things I did is putting those reviews, those stars that allows my users to rate the, the applications in the app market. And it's very important because if they won't rate it, uh, I will not know which application is good or not. But guess what? I committed to launch the app market in August and I knew around May, four years ago, that I will not be ready. So I looked at the product and I thought what to take out. Now, I decided that my apps is not so important, so I took my apps out, but that's easy. When I'm saying taking out features, I'm saying, you know, cut in the flesh. So I took out rating and reviews, which was super important to me. But guess what? The app market still brought value to the users without rating and reviews. And I could start learning from what the users did and talk to users. So I launched it smaller in scope without rating and reviews. And, and that's hard. Uh, Another thing I want to show you about is another very good product in Wix. The taking things out is, uh, is not only a compromise, it actually makes a better product. Look at this product. This is the wireframes of Wix hotels. It's a product that allows you to build hotel and the hotel management system. I like to show it on the screen, but this time it's on the side. But the, so, so bear with me, look at this. The, there was a website, on top of it there was a management system, which is works booking, which is those, this wireframe over there. And the product manager had two very important call to actions that he wanted the users to click. One is manage booking engine, which is the blue button on the top, and the other one is another thing on the bottom. And he came to me and he told me, David, I don't think the call to actions are clear enough. What do we do? Maybe we will make them bigger. Maybe we will color them orange and not blue. And you can guess what I told him. Take the bullshit out. You have tons of shit there. Take it out. Now look, that's the same panel. As you can see, about 70% of the shit is been taken out. Now it's not shit. It's not been piling out shit. It's all very important things. But they're very important. They're not critical. And when you take the very important things out, you're left with the two critical call to actions. They are clear, even if the designer is not a genius. And that's the power of being an omen. Uh, how much time do I have? 
about five minutes. Okay. So we we'll get to talk about this, but, but I must tell you, you're a very disappointing audience. You are silent and you're not talking. And this means you waste your time because this is on YouTube. I did this many times. So you can watch it on YouTube. So everybody is welcome to leave. So if you have questions, that will be a useful usage of your time. But I'm in Ukraine and Ukrainians never ask me questions. So I'm trying, you know, get to know your users, right? So let's talk a little bit about managing growth. Managing growth is something you will get to in a later stage of your company where your company is going to grow up. Uh, this graph shows the growth of Wix uh, from the time I joined Wix. A little early, we started 170, 261. We were about 450 when we IPO'd. Uh, we were uh, 952 in merch, and now we are 1,400 people, about half of them engineers. Uh, how do you manage such growth? How do you maintain the core values of your organization? Wix is strong in innovation and in technology and in startup atmosphere. How do you maintain this when your organization grows to 1,400 people? So that's the challenge we've been facing. So the first time we were facing this challenge is where we crossed the 100 people barrier. I don't know if you know that organization that is 100 people is still an organization where everybody knows everybody. Uh, when you cross 100 people, People are not, not everybody in the organization knows everybody else. And the management of Wix at the time was very worried about uh, how to maintain the startup atmosphere. And what they did, they did something very interesting. They hired five people that were entrepreneurs. People who never worked in companies or worked in companies and then started startups, but were entrepreneurs that just closed their startups. And they brought them to the company and they told them they didn't tell them anything. They told them, think of us as investors. Go in Wix, look around, come with ideas that are smart, that are innovative, that will help us maintain the core values, innovation, technology, startup atmosphere, etc. And there were five of us, and uh, everybody chose a different solution. And by the way, that is something nice about experimenting. You can check out different solutions and pick up the best. So one of us just became a part of the organization of Greater Wix, Another one came with this crazy idea that was not connected to Wix at all. And we allowed him to, him to leave the company and start a startup of his own, which still exists, called The Pulse, very nice startup. Two others did not survive. They could not survive the transition between a startup and a company. It happens. Uh, what I did, I built a startup inside the organization. I took two software engineers and one product manager and one designer. And I did like a mini startup inside the company. I used Wix resources, I used Wix technology, I used Wix brand, I did things that are relevant for Wix needs, but I did them as an independent startup. And it was like eating the cake and leaving it as a whole. Because I had all the advantages of startup, I had a team of five, six, ten people. Everybody knew each other, everybody thought only about their product, it was true startup atmosphere. But on the other hand, I had greater Wix behind me with the users and the technology, etc. Uh, so when we crossed, when, when we knew we were going to cross the 1,000 people barrier, what we basically decided to do is to take this model and make it a model that works for the entire company. And we call it the models of the company and the guilds. So we started, but by breaking the company into 28 different companies, not financially, not from a legal perspective, but from essence perspective. 28 companies, every company is oriented around the product. So we have a company that does editor, and we have a company that does Wix hotels, and a company that does stores, and a company that does bookings, and so on and so forth. Every company has all the resources they need. They have their own engineers, and they have their own product managers, and their own designers, and their own BI analysis, and so on and so forth. And they have a CEO, which is the head of the company and manages the company. The largest one in Wix is 100 people. The smaller one is three people. And another thing we did, we thought, well, great, we'll have independent companies and independent startups. But how do we make sure that the knowledge is still spread around the organization? So we have another part of our organization, which is called the guild. What is a guild? A guild 
is, okay, let's say you are a server engineer in Wix stores. So your company is Wix stores, you're a server engineer, you report to your team lead, which reports to the head of R&D of Wix stores, which reports to the CEO of Wix stores. But you are a member of a different organization as well, an horizontal organization. You are a member of the Server Developers Guild. And one day every week, the Server Developers Guild steal you from the company, and they take you to work on interesting server problems in different companies in Wix. And they teach you server engineering. And they make sure they let you write the server infrastructure of Wix. And if you are a product manager in Wix, so you're a product manager in Wix, you work in Wix stores with him, maybe you do product together, and uh, you report to the head of product in Wix stores, which report to the CEO, but you're also part of the product guild. And in the product guild, not one day every week, but one week every month, the product guild steals you. You're doing other products in Wix. You're learning the Wix methodology. You challenge the Wix methodology. You're a designer, same thing. You're a designer in a company, you're a designer in a guild, and so on and so forth. So, uh, it sounds perfect, but let me tell you a little bit about the problems of this model. Because there is no perfect model. It's a model that works for us, but it's not perfect. Problems of this model. One big problem, if there is one thing that frightens a Wix person, you want to frighten a Wix person, yell in their ear, dependency. Let's say you are from Wix stores, and you are from Wix bookings, and you two companies need to collaborate on a project. It's very hard. You are in your own startup mind. You are in your own startup mind. Dependency is hard for us. Another thing that bothers us is what we call the Stripe effect. Everybody is familiar with Stripe? Stripe is a payment gateway. It allows Wix users to take money from their visitors. So if you have a store, you connect to Stripe, and you charge money. But guess what? Stores need Stripe. Hotels need Stripe. Bookings need Stripe. Everybody in Wix needs Stripe, right? And PayPal and so on and so forth. I myself did Stripe integration in Wix seven times. Trust me. Now you may say, yes, you learned. But you know, it doesn't work this way. Let's say you did Stripe integration for stores and then you come and do Stripe integration for hotels. You don't have time for him, he doesn't have time for you. So basically the shortest path is for you to do Stripe by yourselves. Now we're not totally stupid. Eventually we understood that connected payment gateway is something we do again and again and again and again. So what we did, we built a startup inside Wix that will do connecting payment gateways for the entire Wix. Because that is the way we solve things inside Wix. But before that we did waste time and resources. So what I'm trying to say is that this model has its own disadvantages. It works for us. The lesson here is not imitating this and trying to do this model. The lesson is find a model that works for you. Don't work for the model. You can break models, you can change models. Find a model that works for you. Make sure that you know that you're paying the prices, but they're worth the benefit. So that's basically what I wanted to tell you today. Don't trust anything I said. Think for yourselves. Just use it as a source of, in, of, of inspiration or whatever. Uh, last try, any questions? Anybody wants to say anything? Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, tell us, uh, please, one, one, two, three. Uh, tell us, please, a few thoughts about your successful marketing on the West, uh, West market. So they have many strong competitors, so how do you fight with them? Thank you. Let me see if I understood the question. You want to know a little bit about how we do marketing? Uh, yes, in Western market, yeah. in a situation yeah, when yeah. there are very many strong competitors. Okay. So, how to uh, so uh, it's an interesting question. How do you do... You are here in Ukraine, we are in Israel. How do you do marketing for the US market or for markets in 190 countries in the world? Uh, I can tell you again what Wix did. It's not necessarily the right solution for you. Uh, we made a decision very early in the company stage never to hire salespeople. So we don't do any face-to-face -face marketing. We have huge disadvantage there. Israelis are not as good in sales as Americans. I guess Ukrainians are not as good in sales in the US as Americans. That is a place where we have a strong disadvantage. 
But there is a battlefield where we're all equals, and that's the internet. So we went to the internet. So that's the first decision we took. We do marketing only online. Eventually, when the company grew up, we started to do branding, etc. But we started with the core, doing online. We are good in technology. That's what we're good at. So we treated marketing like we treat technology. We used information. We used lots of analytics. We tried. We sampled. We saw what works. We saw what not works. We did A-B testing on everything we did. We basically did everything we do good in product, in marketing. So I would say in the first five or six years of Wix, all we did was technology, internet-oriented marketing. Again, I'm not saying it's right for your business, but I think that for us, Israelis, Ukrainians, I think it's, you know, the other alternative is to go open a US office, hire Americans. I think it's a bigger challenge. Try to focus on what you're good at. Uh, and, and that's what Wix does to this very day. By the way, we still don't have any salespeople. Because that's not what we do. We're, we're a technology company. We do innovation. We're not good in sales. And, and, and it's better to become more better in what you're good at than. So again, I don't know if that's the right solution for you, but that's, that's what we did. Any other questions, guys? If you're not asking questions, you're wasting time. It's on YouTube. You waste I, the time coming here. Yeah, questions, I, I, questions. I have a question to you. Uh, you have pointed that you are sharing resources between your sub-companies. Uh, I'm interested in, uh, in how you are avoiding uh, resources lack on your own projects within tiny companies. So you share a resource, then you're missing this resource. So how do you fill uh, this gap? How do we manage resources between the companies? Okay. Uh, Ordinary time, we don't. Meaning basically, if you are working in the company stores, you are working in the company stores, and just like if your neighbor startup, which you may like a lot, will not give you an engineer or a designer if you need one, uh, you will not, stores will not get an engineer from bookings. That's the general guiding rule. Uh, the purpose is for someone to be part of a startup, and if you want that, pay the price of a non-optimal resources distribution around the organization. Having said that, there are exceptions to this rule. First exception is growing people. Let's say he works as an engineer in stores, and stores don't have a position open for team lead, and he can be a manager, but hotels have a position for team lead. We may, for his growth, move him to hotels so he can grow. Another exception to the rule, once in a while, Wix does this huge effort of taking something, to, of doing a revolution. Last year, we did a product called ADI, Artificial Design Intelligence. A very complex artificial intelligence product, basically teaching machines to differentiate between beautiful and non-beautiful. So in that case, yes, we take resources, we dry companies. But the general guiding rule, a person from a company belongs to the company. And if a company wants to grow, hire more people, it's just like a startup, they need to raise money. They go to the management, they tell them, you know, with this amount of people, I will do this project. With that amount of people, I will do a better project. Give me more people, just like recruiting money. By the way, because we are in the no-man approach, we will always try to tell them, can you do this with less people? But eventually, you know, or the organization grows. Is it working? Yes. Yeah. Can I, can I ask a question here? Hi. Uh, you, said, you said that you are constantly talking to your customers of your competitors. How you do that? And the other question, um, the funnel, um, how do you move leads through the funnel? I mean, you're saying that you are not using salespeople, so you're not doing like cold callings, not follow-ups, nothing at all like that. So what you do to move leads through the funnel? So that's two questions. Yeah, okay. thank you. How do we talk to people in the funnel or are they move inside the funnel? Um, what you do to move them through the funnel to the okay. conversion. Okay. Uh, so let's start with the funnel. And then you'll remind me what was the first and I'll go back there. Uh, the starting of the funnel mostly comes either from word of mouth or from internet marketing. So we will begin by doing a campaign in Google or Facebook uh, that will be targeted to a specific intent Let's say we know that hotel owners wants to build a website for the hotel and want to have a booking system for the hotel. So we'll do a very targeted campaign to this. We'll launch several campaigns at the same time and we'll do a landing page and we'll test how many people arrive to this landing page. 
We will not do one landing page, we'll do several landing pages per campaign. We'll check out which landing pages works better. Then they go to the login page. We have several login screens constantly being checked. Just to share something with you, we had 83% of the people dropping in the login stage. And we had sign up with Google, sign up with Facebook. We did an experiment, we changed sign up with Google, sign up with Facebook to continue with Google, continue with Facebook. No software engineering, no nothing, change of two words. We experimented, it improved it from 83% to 82%. It's, it's, it's tens of millions of dollars, two words. And, and it goes on and on and on and on for the entire, so it's constantly doing several options, testing which works better. It's easier now when we have 100 million users when you are smaller, it's a little harder because mathematically, if you have smaller amount of users, it will take you longer time to get significant results. But, but that's, that's the only way to do it. So even if it takes time, it's worth the effort. What was the first question, remind me? How do we find the customers of the competition? Uh, it's, it's interesting, you know, most of the customers of the competition in the US uh, we built our support team in the US. So we have something like 200 support people uh, in, in US doing support calls. Uh, Shopify is a product for people, you know, it's, it's not a consumer product, but it's a problem for small businesses. So I basically asked my employees to ask their friends, do they know people who use Shopify? Uh, and uh, another thing I did, uh, I went to a website called Craigslist and I published an ad saying basically if you're a Shopify user, I wish to talk to you and talk about your experience and they'll give you $100 uh, vouchers for Amazon. So, you know, simple stuff. One more. Uh, how did you change the global paradigm uh, that website development is for developers, uh, for software developers, but not for all people? It's a very interesting question. Uh, the world is divided when you talk about computer expertise. My grandmother, my father, my mother, my sister, basic office users use Word, Excel, access, simple web developers, and then it goes there and there, server side, at the end there is some Peter or something who's into like high-end software engineering. Uh, when we started, uh, it was more or less the access people and then basic software engineers, people who were using tools like WordPress, Drupal, like basic software engineering. Uh, and uh, what we did was basically uh, going online and uh, going to websites uh, for designers. That's where, that's where Wix de decided, because the software engineer is working with designer. The designer mostly doesn't know how to write code. So if the software engineer and the designer are doing a website, we said, let's tell the designer they don't need the software engineer anymore. So we went to design websites and published ads that basically saying, you know, you can do it yourself. And that was the beginning. And then we, we hit it on Google and we hit it on Facebook. And uh, the first market we went to were designers. And then eventually we said, you know, a small business who's fighting on budget will go online and, and search build your website, probably looking for those software engineers to build their websites. We will bump them with ads. You can do it yourself. Uh, and I think that was the way we, we decided. The interesting thing about your question is that now, if Wix is addressing more or less the office users range, we are trying to move to this side, to my grandmother. That's why we did the ADI, the Artificial Design Intelligence Tool, where you basically just tell the tool who you are, and they build you a beautiful website. And that's, that's a huge technology challenge, but that's also a marketing challenge. Uh, and to change the image, to tell people, don't be afraid. You can actually DIY, do it yourself this. And another thing we're very interested at is, is going to that side of the side, to those software engineers who are coding the website and tell them, you know, we can cut your work by 70%, 90%. We'll do most of your work automatically and leave you the ability to program all our components, etc. But it's a big challenge because it's growing, you know, to this side and to that side. Yeah, it's challenging. 
Any other questions? Yes, yes, I'm here uh, on the other side. Ah, yeah. Uh, so, um, you told that uh, the best way to learn customer is to um, speak to them, yeah? Uh, so, um, for example, if we are talking about small startup, uh, how do you think, at what stage should we um, ask customers? Only when we have just launched it, or maybe with some time, uh, if we, it, it, it starts, yes, some time has gone, and then ask some questions. The answer is very clear yesterday meaning basically uh, if you have an idea uh, the idea you didn't code it yet you're just in the idea stage but you know what you you know or you think you know what you want to do you know who your audience more or less I would make a huge effort contacting these people and talk to them you are building a, a software for American architects Go to American Architects forums. Tell, I'm building a software product for you. Is anybody willing to talk to me? They will. You don't have to travel to the US for that. You can do it online, over phone, via chat. Uh, I use Facebook Messenger a lot to talk to users in, in various Facebook groups. So the answer is yesterday and with every mean you can. The only thing you will need for that is, is knowing English, basically. And uh, one more, one more yeah. question. Um, well, uh, when you were talking about no man, uh, you um, um, told that uh, first of all we should ask like, uh, do we need this uh, idea or do we need this setup at all? And um, I think that you cannot tell if uh, this or that startup is going to be successful until you launch it. And uh, how do you think it's um, your approach? Maybe it is too much critical. How do you think about that? It's a, very, it's a very interesting question. Uh, I, I know it because before Wix had three startups, so I, I confronted this challenge myself. Uh, when you have the product, you can, yes, you can get real data from users and, and you will be in a better stage. When you have an idea, you are in a disadvantage because you are guessing. You can minimize the disadvantage by talking to as much as you can from your audience, learning your competition, like learning the product's competition very well, see what works, see what not work. Very rarely we are in an empty space. Mostly there are some other players in the space. We can learn a lot from them. Uh, but eventually, uh, I would go to the core. What is the intent of your user? Try to guess the intent of the user and build a minimal product of high quality that answer the intent. If your user wants to build a website, that's a very specific intent. Your user wants to listen to a whole album and not songs. I had a music search engine, so I give an example for intent. Your user is an ISP. They want to cut the expenses on international lines, so on and so forth. Identify the most basic intent. Build a product that answers the intent. And after that, you can start learning from... Then you get into the advantage stage where you can start. But don't skip talking to your audience and find their intent. And definitely do guess what the minimal thing is. Because if you will not, and you build like seven or eight things, you know, you can build seven or eight things, but build seven or eight small things and guess between them. Don't do this huge product with tens of features that are nice to have. That is always a mistake for a startup, because it will kill you, I think. Maybe I'm wrong, you know, but... Yes. We're finished? Guys, thanks a lot for your time. <laughs>